This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the oncoming economy collapse and what you can do about it. Enjoy. What are you calling to me from outside of a dream? Welcome to the Age of Jeremy. My name is Jeremy Quintanilla, and this is a podcast all about my journey in entrepreneurship. I own a business called Q Consolidated, and it owns many of my other businesses, the ones that you may know, like 3T Warrior Academy, Age of Radio, Q Financial, Merlin, the smartest way to track your crypto, to name a few. And this podcast is all about all the things that I have going on in my businesses, and I'm sharing with you what I'm learning so that you can hopefully make better decisions, better decisions than I made during my journey. If you want to follow me, you can follow me on all social medias at Age of Jeremy. I have all kinds of great stuff going across all of the social medias, um, especially on TikTok, on Instagram, on Lemonade, on Threads, and Happy Birthday Threads. I know that you just shared your or had your first year birthday, you are now one and it has been one hell of a great time because I personally enjoy threads better than X. If you enjoy threads better than X as well, go ahead, follow me on Instagram. Let me know why, or I guess follow me on threads and know why would be the smarter thing to do or to say, right? I don't know. I just say the first thing that comes to my mind sometimes. All right. So that being said, make sure that you follow me across all social media so you know everything that's going on in all of our businesses that we have, and hopefully you can get some uh, golden nuggets or some wisdom along the way. That is the point of it all. Um, the last thing that I want to say before we jump into this episode, I'm trying to condense this introduction and make it like I don't have like a billion things going on, but I do. So I, I, I two things I want to say. One, Go head on over to Age of Radio on YouTube. Make sure that you listen to all the amazing podcasts that are on our Age of Radio podcast network. Then the second thing that I want to let you know is we are having a July Freedom Flash Sale for 3T Warrior Academy. So go over to 3TWarrior.com. That's 3TWarrior.com. And you can get access to the flash sale. Or there is a link in the episode description here. Or if you follow Coach JV, you can Go on his, uh, uh, I guess, his social medias, hit his link tree, and you can get in that way. Um, there's a heavy discount if you purchase and be a part of the 3T Warrior Academy right now. If you don't know what the 3T Warrior Academy is, it is everything that you need to get your shit together from fitness to motivation um, to understanding our financial or to gaining financial literacy. There's so much stuff that's not taught in schools, and we're working to teach that to as many people as possible so more and more people can move towards being an entrepreneur being an entrepreneur and setting themselves up for generational wealth. So head on over to 3twarrior.com to learn more about that as well. All right, let's go into this episode. All right, first things first, this whole episode is around debt. We're going to kick it off with our Bloomberg's article this week. If you don't have a Bloomberg subscription, go ahead and go get a Bloomberg subscription. Eventually, I'm going to reach out to Bloomberg and be like, hey, Michael, Hook me up. Hook me up with a sponsorship because I talk about Bloomberg all of the time. Now, I think that you should have a Bloomberg um, a subscription. If you don't, at least go and follow Bloomberg. They have all kinds of different, I guess, brands underneath the Bloomberg a business name or the Bloomberg brand has many sub brands underneath it, I guess would be the better way to say it. Um, and so I get a lot of ideas for this segment because I follow Bloomberg on lots of social media channels. So when they post certain things from like Bloomberg Wealth, um, and this is coming from Bloomberg Wealth. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, because it's a very big indicator. And I think that if you're not following the news, like with Bloomberg or The Economist or CNN or CNBC, you're going to miss a lot of this stuff. And I want to make sure that you know about this so you can start 
I guess, preparing for right now, whether you're a business owner or whether you are an individual. So first of all, um, this is from uh, Bloomberg. Again, it's by Jill R. Shaw. This is released July 8th, 2024. Make sure that I you know, give credit where credit's due. And they essentially, there's a company called Oak Tree and they focus on um, lending, I guess. Um, and so uh, Oak Tree's Howard Mark sees opening in private equity real estate pain. And so this is important for a couple of reasons. One is because a lot of people go in and they buy distressed debt or lenders that are distressed, they'll buy up that debt and then they'll work to collect on that debt or they'll I guess, tranche it off into other packages and then sell that debt off and work to collect on all of that debt, I guess, would be the best way to say it or like a top level overview. Um, and this is a very big key indicator for the economy that we're going into run, run into some problems with interest rates and people being able to repay their debt. So I'm going to go ahead and talk, read the article, I guess, and talk a little bit about this. So struggling under the weight of interest rates, Highly levered assets within private equity and real estate are promised distressed investors promise are promising distressed investors some of the best opportunities in more than a decade. And this is according to Howard Marks. So he quotes or he says the use of debt to amplify your returns has been the lifeblood of these two asset classes and the asset classes, the asset classes that he is referring to are going to be real estate um, and private equity. So they require a lot of debt or a lot of lending to get off the ground, especially because in real estate, uh, if you've ever listened to any, I guess, a guru on real estate on social media, it's always about leverage the money, borrow the money, use other people's money. Okay. And so when you're, if you're not using other people's money for the form of equity, a lot of the time they'll do it in the form of bonds or of debt. And when you do that, you essentially are leveraging yourself. And so what he's saying is that they've done really well up until now, but that's where the pain will come is going to be in the future when say interest rates change. So risky corporate borrowers, especially those backed by private equity have seen a jump in borrowing costs as a result of rate hikes from the federal reserve in the property market. The value of commercial real estate has fallen while a slow rolling wave of maturities is underway, setting the stage for more lender losses. And that's an opening for firms like Oak tree, which specialize in distressed lending and bargain hunting. So roughly $199 billion of corporate debt in the U.S. is trading in distressed territory, according to data tracked by Bloomberg. So they go in, they buy up this distressed the so Oak Tree is going to go in and buy up a lot of this distressed lending, and then they'll repackage it into different types of securities and then sell those securities and make money on it. Okay. And that's the concept of how this works. So right now and going into the future, leverage companies will not be able to renew their leverage as easily. And the cost of doing so will be higher, said Marx. That gives them, that Oak Tree, better opportunities than they have been seeing. Still, those possibilities are not straightforward for creditors as the practice of pitting lenders against each other in debt restructurings has grown more popular. Such transactions enabled by loopholes in credit agreements have led to ugly fights in the corporate market as well as extensive and costly litigation. If there's an opening, people will take it, he said. It's up to lenders to study documents well enough to prevent it. Marx also struck a cautious tone on bargains in real estate, suggesting that valuations are difficult to gauge even as investors are finding deeply discounted properties. So essentially, this means that we are going to be leading into a debt crisis due to the fact that people have been leveraging, or at least in this case, private equity companies um, and uh, corporate companies have been leveraging so much. And if you remember a few years ago, I had said that in 2025, when a lot of these uh, collateralized debt obligations and lending obligations have a change in their interest rates with these rising interest rates, we are going to see a lot of default on debt. And this is a prime example of that coming to fruition as we are moving closer into 2025. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about what that means when we come back and after our social segment. So make sure that you listen to the whole entire podcast. We'll be right back. Okay. Before I tell you what all of that means and what that means for you and what you should be doing to protect yourself, because uh, the economy is going to kind of, come backwards. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our new segment, our social media segment. I have no names for any segment. All I know is that moving forward, we're going to be talking about news. Then we're going to be talking about 
social media, and then we're going to be talking about the main content, which in this case, it ties back into the first content. So we probably should have arranged this somewhat differently, but here we are. Okay. So I want to, for anybody that's involved with social media marketing or marketing in general, I think that there needs to be a good conversation around Lemon 8. Lemon 8 was one of the, the most downloaded apps or social media apps, at least in 2023. And if you don't know what Lemon 8 is, it is essentially like a TikTok's version of Instagram. So ByteDance owns TikTok and ByteDance also owns Lemon 8. And Lemon 8 is essentially like how Instagram was originally. So if you can think like Threads is how TikTok originally was, then Lemon 8 is originally how Instagram was with, you know, vi some video features. But the video features aren't like pushed as much as the images and the content that's in the conversation that's being presented in the text. Okay. And so on limit eight, what you usually do is you will like take a, a photograph of something or multiple photographs and they have all these cool templates that you can design and stylize and then push that out with, you know, maybe lengthier text about what's going on with the images or having a conversation around something. So it essentially is like the main part of Instagram posts, but it is more like geared towards style and fashion. And I, and I say fashion loosely, more like style and culture, I guess would be a better way to do it. And I think that this is something that all social media influencers or people in social or businesses or brands should have part of at least trying it out. One of the things that's super important when it comes to new things coming on the scene is to try it out and see if you can gain, I guess, traction with it or if your audience is even there. So for me personally, like with the Age of Jeremy brand, which is my personal brand, Age of Jeremy, is that it doesn't necessarily like uh, – I, I have not done a strong enough job creating audience avatars or like audience demographics or or audience like – um, I guess, customer bases, right? So traditionally what you usually want to do with a brand is you want to like contain or not contain, I guess, do some research to find out who's actually listening to you. And then you create what we like to call avatars. There's another word for it, but it's not coming to the top of my mind. And so like, it would be like, okay, so our main audience is say, you know, for me, probably 35 to 45 year olds that are, you know, uh, uh, maybe educated with some college, ha make about, you know, 75 to to $100,000 a year. Probably, I don't know if they would be more le left leaning or right leaning because, frankly, I mean, to be honest, I'm super left, but like there are certain things that r people on the right are okay with because I agree with them on certain things. So, like, for me personally, I'm a big advocate for us being able to have guns, having militias, and that just goes back to, you know, being an anarchist and us being able to overthrow private companies or overthrow the government if we have to. But I also believe that we should be able to form militias and be able to for to purchase weapons that are you know, self defense, not self defense, but aero defense weapons or aero defense stuff um, to protect our, you know, communities. Um, so whether that's missile defense, tanks, jets, um, helicopters, and lots of liberals think that I'm crazy for that, but I don't think that we should be giving up any right or any power to be able to overthrow any kind of institution that is oppressing us. And so liberals think that I'm crazy for that. And people on the right who are pro second amendment are very like, yeah, you know, go Jeremy. But at the same time, on the, <laughs> I also believe that abortion should be legal in all instances. And yes, even if someone's willy nilly going out there, I don't think that this is specifically happening to the extent that people are making us believe that it's happening, but I haven't checked the numbers, but even if people are going out there and fucking everybody and just having babies and aborting them, which seems like a weird thing and a, like a complicated, I, I don't know. I just can't believe that that's a thing that's constantly happening. Uh, and so, but I think that even in that case, you know, abort those babies. I also think babies should be created in labs and we should be able to manipulate the DNA to make a better species for the future. And that's just personally what I believe. Um, and so 
The point is, is that people on the right think that I'm batshit crazy for that. I'm also a big adamant for vaccines. Um, if there is academic research that supports the supports the vaccine, I am okay taking that vaccine, just like I'm okay taking the COVID vaccine and other vaccines. And there is not enough proof, in my opinion, that having the COVID vaccine is detrimental to your health. Can it happen? Of course, but I'm assuming that that can happen with anything that we put in our body. Now, Point being is, is that I would probably have a demographic, like I said, 35 to 45, $100,000 of income, maybe right leaning, maybe left leaning, maybe central leaning. I don't know. And that would be, and and they live in, I don't know, California, Arizona, Oregon, or the West coast. And then I can have an, then there might be another small pocket of people to listen to me that fit another demographic. And these more of these audiences that I have, that is how I can tailor my content for those audiences. So going back to the social media piece, it can also work or does work the same with social media. If the new social media platform, as it starts going, you're trying on it and there's some traction finding out if the people that fit into your other audiences, your other avatars are on that social media platform, then you should be posting on that social media platform. If they are not, then you don't need to be wasting your time on that social media platform. So one of the things that I could recommend to start to try with Lemon 8 is to do diary entries and and carousel images. So If for instance, like I'm doing a, I'm been reading a lot on research. I'm trying to find a topic that I want to study to write an ethno, an ethnomusicology article on. And I would prefer that it had something to do with religion and music, because that's the thing that I want to kind of, if I were to specialize in ethnomusicology, that's what I would want to do. I would want to look at music and how it relates to say spirit possession or how it relates to, um, uh, or how it relates to um, uh, uh, to enlightenment or meditation. And so I have a research, uh, academic research book that I have to ke- help teach academics how to do research. I have some ethnomusicology books. I have some very short introduction to ethnomusicology, very short introduction to folk music, very short introduction. These are all by Oxford books. And so I could take pictures of those and, you know, make them all look nice. I can post those up as a carousel and then I can write and talk about kind of what I just did with you in the text portion of it. And that would be a post that would make sense from an age of Jeremy brand. Now, if from a business perspective, I, if I had an age of radio one, maybe I could take all of the thumbnails of all of the shows that are doing well on the podcast network that week. I could maybe design them up a little bit to give them some more fashion and some more flair or some more life style. And then I could go ahead and post those and then talk about them. And so I would recommend that you try this for your brand or for whether it's a a business brand or your personal brand and start playing with lemon eight and seeing if it starts getting you some traction because it might end up that my individuals that follow me regularly aren't on there and I may never get traction at it. But I think a good rule of thumb is to try something consistently for nine months. Um, That's something that I learned from Joe Palazzi, who is uh, one of my heroes in content marketing. He has the content marketing Institute that I think that he sold. And now he has tilt uh, I think is a business or a newsletter that he has. And uh, you can follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, And so he says, just try something for nine months, do it consistently for nine months, then reassess it and see if it makes sense. But you have to give it enough time time for it to start getting traction. And if you're wiggly wobbly in there, you have to maintain that consistency to start seeing if it can gain traction. And then if it does give it another nine months to see what happens. So I want all of you to go out, try play around with, do some stuff with lemonade, reach out to me on lemonade, reach out to me on Instagram, reach out to me on Snapchat. Let me know what are some of the things that you enjoy about lemonade. Maybe you guys can give me some tips. Um, I would really appreciate that. And I can share them on here. All right. We'll be right back. All right. Thank you so much for waiting from the beginning of this podcast to now to find the link between the debt crisis. Okay. So the beginning article about the debt situation was that a lot of these lenders are going to become come. So a lot of the people, so a lot of the lenders aren't going to get their money back. And so the uh, companies like Oak tree, they're going to go and start purchasing up this debt. They're going to put them all together. And by putting them all together, they're diversifying the 
products that are inside of them and they're able to repackage them and then sell them off at different types of securities. This is the same concept that kind of created our 2009 recession or 2008 recession, but that was done with uh, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and I recommend that everybody take some time, go buy some books on some mortgage-backed securities. Mortgage-backed securities is still the leading way in which we understand the rates of of mortgages. It's also the leading reason, in my opinion, of why mortgages are so goddamn high since the 1950s. Uh, but it's really important that we understand how mortgages work and how securities of mortgages work, especially because we're living in the the time when that game is being played. And so one of the things that I talk a lot about in all of the people that I coach is that if you if you can increase your knowledge base and all of the things that you don't understand as it relates to investing, you will be able to make a lot better decisions on your own. Um or you'll be able to make a lot better decisions based off of the information that other people are telling you if you have advisors that are around you. All entrepreneurs should have advisors. I have uh, CJV, who's one of my advisors. Dustin is one of my main advisors. He's our media team person, um, and he's my main advisor. And even if it's stuff that I don't, I know that he doesn't have a full background in, like, you know, um, finance or maybe like high level leadership, I still want his advice because I value his opinion. Um, and then for media and content, Josh, I go to on almost everything to see what his thoughts are. And I tell Josh to change stuff all the time. Um, but I want to know what he thinks and what he believes is the right thing to do in certain situations when it comes to graphic design and marketing. And I have other people that are around me, the list can go on and on. But the thing is, I still educate myself as much as I can in those areas so that when they're telling me stuff, I can make assessments on a, what they're telling me. And what I think that may or may not work better. And I think that that's one of the things that Jeff Bezos did really, really well um, and helped with Amazon was because he had such a broad knowledge on so much stuff. And so going back to the debt piece is that if 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 we're going to get into these people, I guess, companies and eventually people that are not going to be able to pay their loans back. Um, then it, it is fair to say that that will continuously start or start, I guess, a I guess downfall in the economy where companies are going to have to cut costs. Um, and when they start cutting costs, that eventually goes down to employees. Employees will continue to get laid off. Eventually, consumer sentiment will fall. People will stop putting more money into the stock market. The stock market will drop. And then that's how we kind of go into these periods where we don't have the same GDP growth and we get either into a recession or close to a recession or whatever the case is. And these are just cyclical things that happen in capitalistic societies. And so, it, which is, it, which the the thought or the the philosophical thought or the economical thought on economic economical thought um, the economical thought on that is not really the purpose of this this podcast or my point my point is to make sure that you guys don't get fucked when everybody else who does have that information is working on not getting fucked by possibly fucking other people uh, and so excuse my language I know that I've been trying not to swear as much on this podcast but that's the truth and it pisses me off that the American people my people don't know, or I guess any people, humans, humans don't know what they need to know to be able to make better assessments. And they're taught to not dive deep into understanding these things, which is what keeps them more oppressed and then being able to be manipulated and controlled by governments and corporations. Uh, and so some of the things that you can do, and these are things that we talk about all of the time, but no one ever does it. And I just want to keep like driving a lot of these thoughts home because they are so, so, so important. The number one thing that I think that you can start doing, most people are going to say, start creating a budget. I'm going to say, start learning how to save every freaking penny that you possibly can. And I'm going to say that for a couple of reasons. One is because if you start off by saving as much as you can, whether that's in cash, I don't really give a crap, whether that's in cash, in a bank account, in a savings account, if moving it into a savings account that you don't have access to, moving it to a savings account that your significant other can see on a regular basis and so they can hold, you guys can hold each other accountable, trying to save something. So if you have, don't save, start saving $10 this week. Next week, start saving 20, start saving 30 every week, start saving 40, 50, 60, make it into a way where every day a little bit moves from your checking account into the other savings account outside of the account that you are, you know, using as your operating account. 
And and what that'll do is a few things. One, it'll create the habit of of saving, right? Moving money into a where a place where you're setting it aside. Now, later on in the in time, you can move some of that as it gets built up into investing, where you're keeping some of it as part of an emergency fund. But just start saving as much as you possibly can. Um, and then what's also going to happen is once you start getting good at it, and once you start seeing that it's growing, you can start then playing with stuff and saying, "Hey, look, what are some other ways that we can find ways to increase this amount that we're moving into this on a daily or weekly or monthly basis?" And so from there, you'll start to think, "Okay, I can pay off this thing. I can cut back on this. I can eat ramen every day. I can tr- do. I like to do no spend weeks is one of the best things that I do, or one of the things that I." like to do where I like trying to go as long as I can without spending any money, whether that means now again that I'm not going to, you know, force my niece or my wife to do that, but like I will go where I don't spend any money and I try to encourage them not to spend any money. We won't go out to eat. We won't do, you know, we'll try to cook stuff at home and we'll try to go multiple weeks without getting groceries to see how long the food in the house can last. And it also creates like a, a, um, a uh, a better culture around you know grit um and fortitude and that's really important especially when economies turn downwards now that being said this is the first thing that you need to do because eventually you'll start building up this savings account and what you'll be able to do from there is then you'll be able to split it off into investing and then creating an emergency fund which is the second thing so as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger you want it to go past an emergency fund so you want it to get to maybe being able to cover 3 months of bills or 2 months of bills or 4 months of bills and then you start taking some of it while you're still saving and taking portions of it and investing it in say um stocks or bonds or actually to be honest if the economy is going to go back I wouldn't say stocks or bonds I would say one of the best things that you can do and you might not see a lot of return at first on it would be doing something like index universal life insurance or even a whole life insurance policy uh, a lot of the reasons is being is because if you put it in the stocks and the bonds there's no bottom out okay and so what I mean by that is if you put it into a life insurance policy yes there's going to be some more probably higher fees in it um yes it's going to probably be years where if the stock market's negative, you won't get any returns. Um, But the point is, is that you won't lose any of your principal. So that's one of the biggest things about wealth protection or life insurance policies in this regard is that they're life insurance policies, they're insurance. It's insuring the principal that you have inside of that policy so that you don't lose it. And then to access it, yes, you have to borrow against it. Yes, there might be, you know, um, thing, uh, I guess, fees associated with the borrowing of it, like an interest. Um, but the the way in which index universal life insurances work and whole life insurances work is they're still very beneficial. And I believe that every single person should have one. So if you are interested in learning more about that, there is a link in my episode description. Click that, fill it out. I'll sit down with you and do a free consultation or I'll have one of our wealth, speci- wealth specialists sit down with you and do a consultation with you because that is one of the best ways in which you can save money or put money from a savings account into it so that you have a life insurance and that that bottom is protected. Now, if you're like, I don't really give a shit about life insurances, then yes, buy some stocks, buy some bonds. The treasury bonds will probably do fine the um, uh, during this period of time. And so or not fine during this period of time. It's just like when things are going bad, you pull the money from the stock market and you put it into bonds. And that's going to be very similar. Or you can put it into commodities, precious metals, gold, silvers, I don't know, cows, orange juice, whatever the case is. And it, depending on what's going on in the economy, that could keep it stabilized so that you don't lose as much as if you had it in stocks. But the point is, is get to a, get saving, then create an emergency fund, and then start investing some of that money. Once you start getting good with those things during that period of time, you'll start to be like, okay, I'm saving. I'm feeling better at this. We're cutting back on stuff or what will happen is like, I don't know how to cut back on this. So in the midst of that, you'll also start to create a budget. Now, the budget company that I'm currently trying to utilize and set up is Quick and Simplify. I don't have everything set up on it, so I'm not going to say go and get that one. I would go and get something that works for you, that's easy, that allows you to do a few things. You want to be able to categorize all of the transactions that are connected to your bank account to it, okay? So that if you went and bought like, I don't know, toenail polish, you could put that in personal goods. If you went and bought prescriptions, you could put prescriptions. And you have the ability to change all of that um, like it's very choice, right? You want to be able to have it, it very, it, it has to be easy for you to be able to change and manipulate that stuff. The other thing that you want to be able to do in it is change and manipulate based off of categorical spending. So for instance, if 
during the month you only want to spend 200 bucks on personal goods or 100 bucks on personal goods like toenail polish and you know hair and a massage or maybe not a massage but uh hair, hair uh nail polish and say like razors or whatever then you would like you could put that as a spending limit and as that spending limit starts to get closer and closer you'll be notified about that and it'll keep monitoring you so you can cut back on that spending because the reason why people spend is because they're not actively managing it so the more closely you can actively manage it the better you're going to be able to to cut back and understand what you are spending and you can create really good habits that way so again the first thing is start saving to a point where you can cut and create an emergency fund during that process you'll probably start a budget so you can start cutting back so you can save more stuff now as you're doing that once you start having the budget then it's time to really look at eliminating your debt so you have like a cushion that started you have some money that's being invested you're managing your budget on a monthly you know time frame and then the next thing is you want to figure out how to pay off all of your debts the best way to pay off all of your debts is grind it out get a second job Get a third job, get four or five side hustles. It's going to suck. It's going to be shitty, but then you use all of that money to pay off that debt. Okay. As fast as you possibly can. Now there is a lot of good times for debt. That debt is only beneficial when you're leveraging it by assets. When people, when, so I'm in the camp that no personal debt is good debt. If you can get away with not having personal debt. Now on the flip side, if you're borrowing to leverage, to create income, Hands down, do that every single time, and you will be able to create large amounts of leverage over time. That's the reason why at the beginning of the article, it said that private equity and real estate are the two highly leveraged asset classes because of the fact that you need leverage to buy those asset classes, and hopefully those asset classes are appreciating in value and giving you income, and you're able to afford the debt, except for in this case, they're not probably going to be able to afford the debt. So again... It's all depending on what you're comfortable with. If you're good with no debt at all, whether business and or personal, then do that. Be you, be happy, be comfortable, be satisfied with where you're at in your life. That's what you have to do, okay? So then the next thing that you have to do is you have to um, inform yourself. I think we don't talk about this one enough. Like getting your shit together is not that complicated. It's having an emergency fund, investing, diversifying those investments, having a budget and sticking to the goddamn plan. The last thing that I just want to mention and really stress as we go into more difficult times is fucking educate yourself in all platforms when people and educate yourself in a way in which you're retaining the information and you're practicing using it. So whether you want to listen to an audible or you want to read a book. After you do it, have a book journal, okay? It's just a thing where you write down the shit that you read or you go back and ask questions about the shit that you read because what that does is it keeps it, it allows you to reassess or reaccess the knowledge after you used it, which helps you retain it. And the more and more you talk about what you're learning, the more and more you're going to retain it for longer periods of time. So it's super, super important to be having or to have a book journal on every single thing that you read. And I just stress this. If you have an extra, I don't know, I want to say 40. I know if this could be a lot, especially if you're trying to save. Um, but if you can get an, uh, a Wall Street Journal subscription or a Bloomberg subscription or an Economist subscription, uh, to be to be fair, my favorite one is Bloomberg. I have all of them. But so get a Bloomberg subscription. It's forty dollars a month. I know you're trying to cut back, and we just talked about a down economy. But educate yourself on that. Or I think if you go to the library, you can get access to some of these things for free. I don't know if they have a Bloomberg like digital subscription that you could access for free on there, but they might have the magazines or the Economist there that you could read. But keep educated on what's going on in the business world, and I think Bloomberg makes that pretty easy. And then read as much as you can about economics, okay? The economics in the United States. These could be textbooks. These could be like, just go and find best economic books to understand the economy in America. Read that. Then I would recommend reading the neighboring countries, Mexico Mexico economics, Canadian economics, Greenland economics, South American economics, just to kind of get a broad understanding of what's going on inside of the entire world, okay? Then focus on investing books. Um, Well, I guess you can just have one of those books or read some of them and also read books about investing. The Alchemy of Finance is a really good book. 
um, in the intelligent investor, which is one that we talk about a lot. I'm in love with the psychology of money. I think everybody should read the psychology of money. One of my other favorite books is uh, common uncommon sto- uh, common stocks with uncommon profits because it's a look at fundamental analysis, and I think that that's really really important. Um, and then I would really recommend for fun so you can kind of understand how it works, go take a trading course or look at YouTube on how to use TradingView or learn how to price stocks, learn how stocks work, um, things of that nature, and constantly be educating yourself around those things. So around the economics of the country you're in and the, the surrounding countries of you, what that policy and the foreign policy and the monetary policy looks like. Reading books on investing, whether that's in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, hedge funds, private equity, real estate, read as much as you can on all of it so you can broaden your knowledge, okay? And then and then um, also make sure that you're reading news articles. I Again, Bloomberg would be a really, really good one. So if you are savings, uh, creating a saving, savings like nonstop, learning how to love saving, saving every single penny, creating an emergency fund, diversifying those investments, and in the mix of that, creating a budget, and then informing yourself, you will be able to withstand anything, in my opinion. Um, oh, the last thing that I will say is if you reassess your career, and your career might be one of the ones that would be hit the hardest during a downfall, this would be the time right now to skill set up reskill, make sure that you're prepared for if for some reason you don't have a job or to make sure that you have a side hustle creating wealth so that if your job falls, you have something to fall back on. Just always have a plan in place. Um, One of the best things that people do in investing is hedging and hedging is essentially having a plan B. So I know a lot of times we say don't have a plan A and sometimes not have, or I'm sorry, don't have a plan B. Sometimes not having a plan B does work out, but you're better to hedge your bets um, and it might take longer. It might not work out as large as you can, as hedging does, right? Um, but it will usually work out in the long run if you're hedging your bets. So with that, as I always say, be thankful, grateful, and kind, and we'll talk with you next time. Bye. You were born in your dying, honey, I'm already crying. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure that you like and subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it right now. And if your podcatcher allows you to go ahead and rate it, whatever you think it was for so that we can work to make it even better. Uh, I use Neumann microphones. I record into my Zoom L8. I record to Steinberg's Cubase and I use Waze plugins. The opening song was Positive Charge by Gaslight Anthem. The closing song was Gardens by Trevor Hall. And as I always say, be thankful, grateful, and kind. We'll talk with you next time. Bye.